Everyone, thanks so much for joining us. We'll just wait one minute to get started as folks roll in. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Keegan McChesney, Program Officer on LISC's National Rural Team. Our team works with and through approximately 150 partners that are transforming rural communities in more than 2,400 counties across the country. Welcome to Raising the Roof. Through this webinar series, we seek to share innovations, trends, and best practices from our colleagues as we work together to create quality, affordable housing opportunities. Here at Rural LISC, we talk to folks every day who are trying to find solutions to the housing affordability, stability, sustainability, and quality challenges in their communities. Increasingly, housing practitioners, policymakers, and other stakeholders are turning to shared equity housing models as part of the solution. A recent census of community land trusts, also known as CLTs, and other shared equity entities by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy found that there are more than 300 CLTs and shared equity entities located in almost every state that hold over 40,000 of housing units across the country. This represents a nearly 30% increase in these entities and a nearly 120% increase in the number of shared equity homes compared to 2011 numbers. Study also found that shared equity homes expand home ownership opportunities, serve families in need, and that these entities keep homes affordable over the long term. They're also key community and economic development actors that are also often committed to advancing racial justice and addressing climate change and resilience. To share more about these models, I'm joined today by three subject matter experts with deep and diverse experiences in shared equity housing. First to set the stage is Jenny Gaynor, Director of Shared Equity Housing at NeighborWorks America. We'll then hear from two community-based practitioners, Lisa Byers, Executive Director of Opal Community Land Trust in San Juan County, Washington, and John Wiltsey, Senior Operation Director of the Housing Division at Pathstone Corporation based in Rochester, New York. All webinar attendees are muted. However, we welcome your thoughts, reactions, and questions so please submit them via the chat function. I'll pose as many of the questions to our speakers at the end as time allows. Jenny, thanks so much for being here. The floor is yours. Awesome. Well, thank you first for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, as Keegan said, I'm Jenny Kainer. I'm Director of Shared Equity Housing at NeighborWorks America. Um, as many of you probably know, NeighborWorks America is a congressionally chartered and funded nonpartisan nonprofit, and we provide communities with affordable housing, financial counseling and coaching, training, and resident engagement and collaboration support uh, through our network of more than 240 member organizations in every state, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Uh, and so I will just get right into it, a little bit of an overview of shared equity housing, and then... Um, a little bit about uh, our initiative supporting shared equity housing. So if you wanna go to the next slide, Keegan, and actually uh, open a quick poll, I wanted to get a sense of how familiar those of you joining us today are with shared equity housing. Um, I'm not gonna give away the clues on all of the models and everything else yet, um, but I thought maybe uh, Keegan could, could pop out that poll, help us get started. Um, thank you. Uh, and I will keep on going just a bit to, to talk a little bit more as you get started. I'll leave it open for a second and then we can um, do the results. So on the next slide, I do have a broad definition of shared equity housing. It's really a general term that covers a variety of models. And then there's even more variation within those models in practice. So I'm, I'm glad that Lisa and John will be sharing about their specific work. Um, the main point is really that shared equity homes 
are made affordable and then stay affordable for the long term um, for these ownership models. And so on the next slide, I, I highlight a little bit about that balance because it's not only about preserving affordability, you're balancing affordability and wealth building, you're providing support that can help level out some of those risks and rewards for home ownership. Um, and that support often comes in the form of partnership or stewardship where the program administrator really forms a lasting relationship with the homeowner. So along with that, many of these models really provide a strong community role, either in governance or engagement and support. And so now if we hop over to the next slide and maybe see the results from our poll now that I have also given away all of the models. So, all right, it looks like the majority of folks have heard about these models, which makes sense because, you know, you had to read the description to register. Um, I'm excited to see that there are new folks um, and then that there are a few folks who are kind of uh, maybe our experts and can, can share a little experience in the chat. Um, and I will say it's a little bit as expected with uh, community land trusts being the most uh, well-known of these models, but um, that's why I'll get on into the next slides to share a little bit more. So thank you all. Thanks for sharing. So these are the those are the four models that we include in the NeighborWorks America Shared Equity Initiative. But um, to get a little bit deeper, um, community land trusts and deed restricted programs are distinct organizationally, but they're typically administering the same type of type of home ownership program, where a buyer is purchasing a home at an affordable price and then agreeing from the start to sell it at an affordable price in the future. So that's the affordable price in the future, not a market price in the future. The really specific community land trust model was first created by civil rights activists in the 1960s. They were seeking a new land tenure model to provide better security for Black farmers in the South. The model has really been applied in a wide variety of urban and rural settings since then, and it goes beyond shared equity home ownership, um, which is kind of what you'll hear in those some of those numbers that Keegan shared from the Lincoln Report. The CLT's purpose is to provide is to acquire land and steward it to meet community needs for the long term. Um, that's often housing and home ownership, but in the start, for example, it was about farmland. It could include commercial, community, and other open space. Um, and so the model community land trust bylaws and organizational documents that are available to the public, they really show this unique approach to membership and community control of land in that organizational structure. Um, and then deed restricted programs, they can really be run by nonprofits or municipalities. They typically use a type of legal agreement to preserve lasting affordability, a deed restriction in this case, um, compared to most community land trusts typically use a ground lease to secure that ongoing affordability because they maintain ownership of the land. Um, and so then as Keegan had highlighted, I, I also pulled uh, the new census number from the Lincoln Institute and Grounded Solutions Network study. So there's over 300 um, CLTs and nonprofit shared equity programs nationwide. Um, and this subset of the 15,000 units, those um, that's how many home ownership units are there. So for example, these, these programs might be doing rental and all of those other units that gets us to that, I think, bigger number that was shared in the research. And so then on the next slide, I wanted to highlight the two cooperative housing models that we also include under the umbrella of shared equity, the limited equity housing cooperative and the resident owned manufactured housing community or a RAC. And so both of these, they're cooperative structures, meaning that residents in the building or the community, they own the building or the land as it may be. And so in a limited equity housing cooperative, the cooperative members are purchasing shares, which are sold at an affordable price and designed to appreciate on a limited basis. Again, it's that limited appreciation, uh, selling at an affordable price instead of the market price, the most that you could get for that share down the road. Um, and then those residents in the co-op, they have a lease that provides with them with that right to occupy their specific unit. So just if you're not super familiar, they have many more rights and responsibilities than a renter, um, but they own a share of the building instead of a condo structure where you own your specific unit, if that makes sense. Um, resident uh, RACs 
follow a pretty similar structure. In that case, the residents own their own manufactured home, and then they own shares of the community, that land and infrastructure. Um, and as I was updating my notes, I saw that this uh, number was outdated. I just saw an announcement that the 312th rock just closed. So um, this model is getting more and more common uh, nationwide. And you're gonna hear more from Lisa about CLTs and John's work with rocks coming up. And so then on the next slide, I just, with my limited time, I just wanted to emphasize that shared equity models provide wealth building. But we also um, can focus on some of those additional uh, benefits. They're creating lasting community assets, bringing stability to residents and neighborhoods, and really empowering residents to own and govern their communities. And then on the next slide, I have some highlights of um, NeighborWorks America's Shared Equity Initiative. That's what I'm working on. It was launched in 2019, and since then, We've seen that over 75 of our nearly 250 network organizations are learning about or implementing these models so far. And this number has really been growing steadily um, and I'm really excited about this work and seeing it continue to grow. And we've got uh, within our rural initiative at, ne at NeighborWorks America, there are about 121 member organizations. And when I like, subset all of our work, I saw that 25 of our about 50-ish grant awards have gone to rural initiative members. Um, and the thing that I really noticed um, was that um, 21 of our rural initiative members really showed up. Um, they're about half of the shared equity housing units that we see in our quarterly report. And as you'll see, like from the examples that are here, they are mostly rocks and CLT units that are um, successful and growing in our rural uh, network organizations. So then on the next slide, I just have some highlights of the outcomes and the work um, that we did in our, in our first three years. Um, it's all really highlighted in this report. Um, advancing the promise of shared equity housing models. Um, but what we did when we when we started this work, we saw that some of our network organizations, they were really experienced. They knew all about shared equity and had been doing it from the start. And then others were really still just learning about the work. So we designed our initiative to kind of stretch all across, doing that awareness building, doing that big picture ecosystem, um, field strengthening work and then providing a range of grants in the middle to support people wherever they were in the process of learning, exploring, or implementing. Um, and so the last few slides that I'll, I'll pull up before uh, turning things over are some of the outcomes that we saw in the evaluations that we did of the more mature programs in the network. And so the first one, you'll see that NeighborWorks Montana surveyed their rock residents to try to get a sense of community and interactions and how did their, their um, community with their neighbors change since they uh, became a resident of a rock. And so sometimes that means since they moved in and sometimes that means since the community took ownership and purchased their community. And so as you can see here, there was like about a third of uh, the folks responding found that they were doing more of that kind of engagement um, since they became a RAC. And then on the last slide, I highlighted some of the outcomes from Champlain Housing Trust. And they work in Burlington, Vermont and some of the surrounding counties. And they completed an evaluation in our initiative as well. And I know it's a little bit cut off. I was trying to put too much here on the screen, but the chart on the top left really shows that residents do build wealth in their uh, CLT home ownership tenure. Um, and that wealth does tend to increase over time, typically um, as we see that with home ownership. And so that's like getting towards that 20 plus years of ownership people were selling and coming away with nearly $60,000 in wealth. So again, just emphasizing that lasting affordability doesn't mean no wealth building. It means creating a bit more of a balance in this context. Um, and then CHT did a similar study to look at the non-financial benefits of uh, being a shared equity homeowner in their program. And you can see there that they really were, their homeowners were reporting positive impacts um, since becoming homeowners in many areas of their lives, which again, I think is what we're trying to think about. This really holistic work, individual and community wealth, and like all of the benefits we can bring when we're working on these models. 
And so now I'm going to drop a few links in the chat uh, for that report that I was mentioning with more of those outcomes and a couple of our resources, but I'm really excited to hear more from Lisa and John, and I think I'm turning it right over to Lisa. Thank you. That's great, Jenny. Thank you so much. So I am um, the executive director of Opal Community Land Trust. Opal is an acronym standing for of people and land. We are in the very northwest corner of the country on an island that is about an hour and 15 minute ferry ride from the mainland. Uh, it's a community of about 5,500 people or just over 3,000 households. Okay, next. And um, we are a community that has, like many communities, seen a huge escalation in housing prices. Opal got started uh, in the late 80s and completed its first project in 1994 because of the changes in dynamics between what folks locally could earn and what real estate prices were doing. And this shows you the housing bubble of uh, the you know, early 2000s and then the crash and then the huge price increases that have occurred as a result of COVID and a little bit of retrenchment. The blue line is what's happening with market prices. So we're scraping up near a million dollars for a median priced home. And then the purple line, I guess you could call it, is the price that's affordable for a purchaser earning about 80% of median income. Next, please. And then we add the green line, which shows you how uh, the community land trust median house price has fared during all of that time. So we strive to keep our homes priced uh, so that they're affordable for households around 65% of median income. And that means that we can handle things like changes in interest rates for mortgages and other market factors that still do have some impact um, and make sure that we're maintaining affordability. And that green line represents 196 homes uh, that were original and then resales that we have stewarded over time. So next, please. I wanna really emphasize and kind of lead with what has become shared among community land trusts and those of us who steward long-term affordability, our understanding that it's, um, our work really just begins when we deliver a home. And stewardship is in fact, probably the most important part of what we do. Uh, as a community land trust, we make a commitment to be around in perpetuity. And I kind of like to joke that I don't really know how long that is. I just know it's a really long time. And so we've got to be thinking about the future with everything that we do, uh, with the materials that we use to build, with the staffing structure, uh, making sure that we have a business model that is sustainable. So as Jenny's already talked about, we balance the nonprofit owning the land and the long-term community needs with the needs of individuals to own a home and to have a modest equity gain, you know, a fair return on their home. And our role as the nonprofit is to monitor the ground lease, which essentially means keep in contact, stay connected with our homeowners and our rental tenants. We facilitate every resale. That means we need to maintain staffing and relationships with banks so that when an individual or family is ready to sell their house, we have the staff that have the expertise to uh, facilitate that resale, including helping the homeowner bring a house up into uh, good condition. We provide home buyer education and for people who want to purchase a home. And we also provide housing counseling for our current homeowners and our renters uh, to help them through difficult times. Some of, the, some of our renters wish to work their way towards owning a home. Some of our homeowners hit a rough patch where there is a safety net and as a resource for them. As I mentioned, we also package the loans uh, to go to the lenders and we maintain those relationships. And then of course we do develop new housing. So next please. We have 110 ownership homes uh, in our family of homes and we've provided housing in a whole variety of ways. Uh, most commonly we have bought land that has not been developed uh, with structures 
and we design a neighborhood uh, and hire the contractors and then manage the, the construction process of installing the infrastructure and building the homes. We also buy existing homes and convert those uh, to community land trust homes. We've accepted some donations of existing homes. And then uh, probably the most fun we've had was a string of moving houses. You can see a blue, blue picture here of a house that's on a barge just off the coast of the island that moved from one part of the island around to the other. And we've uh, got about 12 homes that we've moved from various parts around the Salish Sea. So next, please. Uh, we do also have rental housing. We are a community-based organization. And as much as we started out as a community land trust committed to this alternative form of ownership, we listen to the needs of the community. And uh, increasingly, we were hearing the, the need from uh, all corners of the community that we needed, that the community needed more rental housing that would stay available as rental housing. So we have built rental housing. We've done some tax, a tax credit project. Uh, we've purchased existing homes, uh, rental housing projects, and, and converted those and renovated those. So next. And then another thing that we've done that's a little bit different is to create a social impact loan fund. Um, this is a, another partnership with Islanders where individuals can make an investment with us. We pool that capital into a fund uh, utilize our expertise and knowledge about making loans uh, and also about understanding the process of construction. And then we loan that money out to individuals who want to buy or build rep or repair uh, a home. And the goal of the program is not that we're a long-term mortgage banker, but that in fact, we are a bridge loan so that we provide access to people who are credit worthy, but don't yet quite meet the bank standards uh, and sort of move people from being unbankable to bankable. And the derivation of this program really was um, that a lot of what it is that people in the community love about living here is the quirkiness and the characters of individuals who came here in the 60s and 70s when there was there were many more creative ways to uh, gain access to land and build a home. You could live in a yurt for a while, then build one building and then add onto it slowly over time. Um, and a lot of the ways in which people house themselves uh, in that period of time is no longer possible because our mortgage lending industry has become more uh, regulated. Next. So uh, we have uh, 212 households, about 451 people who live in the housing we've created. Uh, that's about 8% of the year round population of our community. Uh, a little over a quarter of the school age children on the island live in Opal homes. Um, and we have a higher percentage of individuals who identify as Hispanic. Uh, and I think that's because we have a lot of rental housing that's accessible to them. Next, please. Oh, we also, I didn't put it on this slide, but we also steward a number of community gardens and we've done a couple of different 99 year commercial uh, leaseholds as well. So as I've already mentioned, and I think I put this slide in here twice because I just wanted to like, it's my way of underlining to say that stewardship really is the prime directive. Um, we need to be around to facilitate those resales and to provide support to our homeowners. And I include in stewardship, the storytelling that we do to help uh, other members of the community connect and uh, be, be our partners, uh, because none of what we do is possible without sort of everybody um, being part of the solution. So next, please. Um, I do wanna just touch briefly on challenges and trends that we're seeing, that uh, challenges have always been banking partners. A steady partner of ours has been USDA Rural Development. We were actually the first community land trust in the country to do a community land trust loan with them, and they've maintained. We've maintained that relationship. Uh, we've had banks come and go, and that partly seems to be related to the staff, where a staff, a loan originator, uh, will really get enamored of the community land trust model, understand what a good deal it is for the bank because we as a nonprofit are there to backstop each of those borrowers. But then the, there's an underwriter who doesn't quite get it or is suspicious or that 
loan or, uh, officer moves to another bank. And so there's constantly a little bit of churn uh, in our experience with uh, our relationships with bankers. Um, we have a new bank now that uh, is actually east of the mountains, and they have created a specific community land trust product and set it at about a point below market rate. So that's just a neat new relationship that we hope will last. Uh, it's one of those small banks that keeps the loans in portfolio. <laughs> so so uh, other challenges are sources of subsidy. The demand for what we do just far outpaces our ability to garner grants and raise money through donations uh, to meet the need. And costs have escalated. And so therefore the amount, but and then have not kept pace with wages, and therefore the amount of subsidy has increased dramatically uh, over our 30 plus years of being around. And then uh, stewardship also, I just want to acknowledge that it's not easy work. It's, it's not a science. Uh, it's some blend of science and art. Uh, it's about relationships with people more than anything else. And as we all know, that um, can be delicate at times. And we have to find that balance where we're not the landlord, you know, they're the owner, they have, uh, they're the decision makers, but we're there to help them and to partner with them. And trends that I've seen, um, I've been in this role for more than 27 years. Uh, and in that period, I've seen much greater interest in and acceptance of community land trusts, which is borne out by the census recent census done. Uh, there's been an increased uh, scale of, for the demand for housing, uh, which just breaks my heart that we live in such a broken system that there's now so much more acceptance of the need for affordable housing uh, because of how uh, widespread the shortage is. And then I continue to see um, folks who get really excited about the idea of long-term affordability and they just want it to be easier to do. So my term for that is that they'll ask, they'll kind of come at it with a, yeah, but, you know, can't we, you know, what, what about just, what that stewardship part, you don't have to worry about that, right? And, and so that's folks who I, um, I sort of say they want long-term affordability light. And we've seen enough examples of where that just doesn't work. You kind of got to go all in and design your program and know that you're going to be around for the long haul. So that's my overview. And now I get to turn it over to John uh, on the other side of the country. Excellent. Hi, everybody. I'm John Wiltsey. I'm the Senior Operations Director at Pathstone. And let's see if we can share this. Hopefully that's up for everybody. Got it? Good. And I'm grateful to be here. Good to share some information about Pastone's Rock um, work. And as of last week, I've been with Pastone for 32 years. Who knew? Amazing place to grow up as a not-for-profit um, professional. And uh, it's been it's been a great ride. But um, this is Pathstone. We're based here in Rochester. We started out as a service organization for migrant farm workers coming to harvest the apples here in upstate New York. And um, Washington still got us beat, but we have the second largest apple crop in the country here in New York State. So we are an agricultural state, believe it or not, and we have a lot of manufactured housing. So a few details about us. We've, you know, we've grown in size and geographic focus over the years. Um, it's a big shop. We got about 650 full-time staff. We operate a whole bunch of human service programs run migrant Head Start centers and run job training programs and, and do a lot in the affordable housing sphere. And we're glad to be members of NeighborWorks since the mid nineties. Um, we were members of the some of the shared equity housing programs that Jenny talked about. So that was a great connection for us. Um, been involved with the Rock USA Network since it was founded and proud founding member of Rural Lisk. In fact, my boss who hired me, Lee Bolak, was one of the first advisory board members when Rural Lisk was first cooked up. So it's, it's been a great connection. Past on, we're joiners. We never, we never met a network we didn't want to join. So we just, we jump on with everything. Why do this work in MHC co-ops and manufactured home community? I'll use MHC as shorthand. Um, just in terms of terminology, 
homes that were built before the HUD code was written in 1976 are mobile homes. And anything that was built after 76 is a manufactured home. So that's, that's the correct terminology. So I'll use MHCs as shorthand. Well, this is a big stock of mostly, you know, unsubsidized affordable housing. And over 75,000 homes in communities in New York alone and several million across the country. And this ownership model presents unique risks. You know, it's it's got these risks because there's this bifurcated ownership interest. You know, the, the homeowner may own the home, but they rent the land. So they're at risk of, you know, the lot rent going up out of their control to a point they can't afford. They're at risk when the community owner may not maintain the infrastructure and the park could potentially become unlivable or condemned over time. And then of course, the worst risk of all is community closure. If, if the park owner just decides, I'd rather sell this land and have a Walmart built there or high-end housing or any number of alternate uses, then you know, people can become homeless. And you know, Pastone was like most of our nonprofit housing brethren, we kind of took the ostrich approach to manufactured home communities for many years and just sort of thought, well, that's that was a really unfortunate housing choice, um, but there's not a lot we can do about it. And it was sort of kind of almost a necessary evil of the housing industry. And we've really come around in our thinking. I mean, we understand, you know, especially the density that's afforded by MHCs, the quality of construction of new homes, a lot of aspects of the industry have really evolved. And it's, you know, we now see it as a, you know, it's a, it's a choice that we can help people build on and make it into a, an asset building strategy rather than an asset stripping strategy. The other thing that's changed is we, we came into this space at the same time as a lot of out of state investor owners were buying up parks and jacking up the rent. And, you know, the industry was really changing 15 years ago and it continues to be a lot of pressure from institutional investors that um, we thought really needed to be offset by a nonprofit presence in this space. So Pascone's been involved in the conversion of 13 MHCs around the state to cooperative ownership. And they range in size from 24 to 172 homes. A couple of them are 55 plus senior communities. And they range in, you know, the, the age and condition of the homes is variable all over the place. They're not, there's no like one size fits all, um, really all types of, of communities that you can imagine have, have proved to be effective, you know, rocks and preserved affordability for their homeowners. This is one of the communities. This is one of the nicest ones, um, sort of our, our poster child for, for the program here. It's about a half an hour south of Rochester and, and it is a 55 plus community. And the residents here, they were trying to get something, trying to get their owner to come to the table for four or five years. And we worked with them on, I believe it was three rounds of negotiation with the owner about the purchase of this. And it took a long time, but they finally succeeded in buying this community as a resident owned community. And it's been a, it's been a huge success. They have, they have great turnout at their meetings. So we are a member of this Rock USA National Network. As, as Jenny said, my information was off their website, 309 rocks. I guess we're up to 312 now, which is awesome, but we're one of 10 nonprofit affiliates in this network. So these are the other groups and I've got a link that I'll, it's at the end of the presentation, but I'll drop a link in the chat, but rockusa.org is the website and you can find contact information for all these groups and see if there's one that's working in your area that you might be able to partner with. So preservation of affordability is kind of job number one here, you know, in addition to security of ownership, but um, this is just a simple graphic showing how, you know, the industry average lot rent increases of 3.9% over time, that, that goes up, you know, hugely. And resident owned communities have had an average of 0.9% annual lot rent increases. So it just makes the, makes the communities much more affordable over time for their residents. I've got some slides here that just are some of the educational materials that we use in our first resident meetings. I just kind of threw them in here so that give you an idea of the way that we talk to residents about this model. And this is um, really, Jenny touched on this, did a great job of explaining these different ownership models, but obviously the, the center one in the co housing co-op 
all the members sort of have a combined ownership of the entire property. There is no subdivision of the land. It's, it's a fractional ownership of the undivided real property. And how it works is Path Stone provides this technical assistance and training to groups of residents, group, groups of homeowners, and we help them through the process of buying the community, but we also stick around for a minimum of 10 years of, of post-purchase technical assistance. So they know that we're going to be there to work with them through board leadership transitions and infrastructure projects and whatever, whatever may come in the future. And I mean, we help them with, you know, forming a limited equity cooperative corporation. Um, they decide how much the membership interests in that corporation are going to be. Most of them choose a hundred bucks as like a one-time purchase of their share in the company. And then, um, you know, one membership per home and the co-op borrows, we help them to borrow all the money that they need to do the transaction. So there's no big, like, you know, out-of-pocket expectation of homeowners, just a simple purchase, one-time purchase of their share. And we help them through the process of negotiating the purchase contract with the owner, doing all the due diligence, the environmental assessments and engineering assessments, and, you know, really through the whole development process. Um, I don't get into that process too much in the slides because I'm keeping this fairly general, but um, this this could easily be an hour long presentation, but I'll keep it I'll keep it short for you. And how they operate, you know, the, the principle is everybody who's a member of the corporation needs to own a home in the community. So, but you know, a lot of communities have rental homes in them. So we just seek to transition those into home ownership, you know, after after the community becomes a co-op. But um, members have, you know, the day-to-day, -day, they decide on the major business decisions, but they delegate responsibility for the day-to-day -to, -day to their board of directors, and then they, they hire a property management company to, to really provide professional management of the community. And, you know, we help them to get the financing for this. Um, these are some of the lenders that we've partnered with. Rock USA Capital is the Rock USA Networks kind of financing mechanism. But um, we've worked with a variety of CDFI lenders, and they, they tend to be more amenable to this. But on refi of these communities, when they get to that first 10 or 15 year term of their mortgage, several of them have gone with local banks as a refi option, which is, which is great to have a local lender engaged with the long-term health of these communities. And the, rem the members own you know, the community and run it together. They, they don't own their site, they, the corporation owns the whole thing, but they have this perpetual right to occupy a, a site in the community. And they, they continue to pay rent, but now it's like occupancy charges to the corporation that they're a member of. But that's the, the lot rent is really what drives all of the financial feasibility of the community. But we've removed the profit motive. You know, any, any excess lot rent goes into the reserves and they can, they can plan. We help them to develop a capital improvement plan for the community so that they know five years from now, they're gonna to have to repo, repave you know, this section of the park. And, and 10 years from now, they're gonna to have to do water line projects. So we set aside in their budget every year, the amount that they're gonna need you know, to meet those long-term upkeep needs of the community. And the, 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 the limited equity aspect of it is the fixed membership price for that membership interest. But there is no limit to the home equity. They, they can sell their home for whatever the market will bear. So, so we feel like that's a reasonable compromise. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't price out people who want to buy in by nature of a high share price, like some of the um, other co-op models that are out there in this space. I mean, there's like retirement communities in the Sun Belt that have, you know, MHCs that are co-ops where it may cost 50, 60, 80 thousand dollars to buy a share. So, so this is obviously a, a geared toward, you know, LMI homeowners, and and most of our residents are LMI households. Um, but we don't have restrictions on sale of homes to part particular income bands of people. Um, but it definitely appeals to you know lower income folks. And if if competing prices, if competing offers come in for a home in the park. We do expect the, the co-ops will give priority to LMI buyers um, for the first 30 days that homes are available for sale. So um, 
yeah, the, the all new people who buy homes in the park after it's a co-op must become members of the co-op. So that way it becomes increasingly a higher percentage of sort of owner members over time. But nobody's evicted from the community because they choose not to be a member of the co-op. They can continue to be a renter and a non-member. It's just their new landlord is the co-op corporation. And they pay the bills just like any community owner for all the normal you know, upkeep and operation costs. Um, as I said, capital improvement planning is a big part of our work with the board. So we help them to understand, you know, what they need to set aside for the future to fix things before they break. And then um, resident choice of, you know, nonprofit ownership versus cooperative ownership is something that's come up over the years. Vermont has sort of a, a model in their state statute, which, which really requires that residents and communities be given this choice whether they'd rather have a nonprofit by their community or form a co-op. And New York is seeking to sort of emulate that. Our state housing agency is really kind of pushing us in this direction to make sure that cooperative ownership is not kind of a one option or nothing, you know, that, that, that there be sort of an option B. And, and we're looking at this as an opportunity because um, for one thing, Pastone is now, you know, considering the idea of being a transitional owner of communities under certain circumstances with the resident corporation being like the exit channel. So, so we, would, we would always give the option to the residents to, to form a co-op. And we hope that our nonprofit partners that we're engaging to buy communities are also, we're kind of coaching them in using the co-op as you know, their, their exit strategy as well. But a lot of communities you know, could benefit from a strong nonprofit ownership because they may have a lot of rental homes that could be converted to owner occupied. They may have a lot of vacant sites or homes that need a lot of repair and big infrastructure projects that a nonprofit could facilitate. Um, so there's three nonprofits in New York that have bought MHCs and um, we're working with them to support them and hope to see those become co-ops in the future. And then um, opportunity to purchase legislation. This is a big issue. Um, the laws you know, that govern the opportunity for people to have an opportunity to buy their community because most of these MHCs, you know, they get bought and sold sort of under cover of darkness between investor owners. They may not ever get listed as you know, commercial property for sale. And um, even if they are listed, you know, most states have no protections for residents in these cases. The owner can sell to whoever they choose. But 17 states do have some protection for residents. Um, and there's the National Consumer Law Center is NCLC. And they've got a great map on their website, um, which I have linked in the next couple slides. So you can look at what protections may exist in your state. Um, Vermont has this interesting model, as I said, the laws you know, may only provide a notice of sale to the residents that, oh, by the way, your park is being sold. Um, but you know, and, and a stronger law would be if, if there's opportunity to purchase, if the proposed use of the land is gonna change in the future, and that's what New York has. And then the strongest laws are those that require the owner of the park to negotiate in good faith with the residents um, to really try to put together a deal for them to buy the community. And I just heard that Connecticut passed a, a good opportunity to purchase law. So they've joined this New England cohort of, of states with, with really strong resident protections. New York has a law that's on the, on the governor's desk right now awaiting her signature. And she vetoed it last year because of investor owner pressure. So we're fingers crossed that New York actually gets a better OTP law. Um, some of the challenges, you know, obviously access to financing and staff capacity are big hurdles, but, you know, the communities that have willing sellers that want to, you know, sell to a resident corporation, you know, those might be the communities that are the least likely to be viable co-ops, you know, because of high vacancy rates, high levels of rental homes, a lot of neglect in the community, and, and the communities with a lot of engaged, interested residents might not necessarily be the ones that the owners want to deal with us on. So that, that alignment is tricky. And then um, you know, we need to be able to move fast when communities come up on the market. 
we're competing against other investor buyers and they can close deals in 45 days. And so, you know, we, we need more time than that, but, um, you know, we, we, we can hopefully turn these things around in, you know, anywhere from four to six months is kind of an ideal time frame for our transactions to close. And I've got some resources here, which I'll, I'll drop these links in the chat as well. And i um, happy to answer any questions anybody may have. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jenny, Lisa, John. Super informative. Appreciate all of your expertise, your various perspectives. And we will jump right into some Q&A. Um, we got a great question here that I think all three of you can address. What advice would you give to those of us who would like to educate our communities and municipalities on the benefits to them of adopting this model? Um, I'll jump in and say that uh, it seems like every community loves it. Uh, if, you're if you're not from the community where you live, then it's easier to be an expert. Um, so, you know, bringing in a guest from another community, even if it's just a few communities over and kind of making a big splash about it and getting, if you've got a, a group of folks who've been organizing, um, sort of make it an educational opportunity, invite your council members or your elected officials. Um, yeah, that's my general thought on that. I can hop in and say uh, a lot of times um, shared equity models in particular, they have amazing community ownership benefits, but they're also very efficient in terms of like subsidy, you're subsidizing a home once and you're preserving that affordability over a long time. And so I think that um, some of the research and the data that shows that and like demonstrates that balance between um, ongoing affordability and wealth building has been um, something that, that people typically highlight when they're uh, looking for uh, support for their programs. I see the question from Shannon there. I'll take that one on. So um, great question. You know, we work this from both ends. The, she asks, um, do we seek out MHCs for sale um, or do we approach the, you know, do we go from the owner end to the, or, the, or the resident end? Um, we really do both, although we find it much more likely that we'll succeed if we target the park owners themselves. And we work through real estate brokers that tend to list a lot of MHCs. And we go, at, you know, we, we try to get them to give us leads of communities that they know might be coming on the market, you know, and, and, and definitely we've had good success talking with owners who may be long term owners, you know, that what we call kind of the mom and pop investor owned communities that are retiring, they're getting out of the business, the kids don't necessarily want to take it over, and they don't want to cast their residents on the open waters of the real estate trusts coming in and, and jacking up rents. So, so they're our best customers in terms of sellers. Um, but unfortunately, there's fewer and fewer of those kind of mom and pop owned communities out there. Most the consolidation in the industry has been has been scary and shocking to see, you know, the national investor owner firms gobbling up communities. But it groups of residents that come to us. I mean, we have had a couple of successes. With, with groups of organized residents coming, and then we approach the owner, you know, but we always need to create a little bit of distance there, you know, because the owner doesn't want to be disclosing financial information about the community to their tenants. I mean, they, and they see them as tenants, they don't see them as homeowners. So we have to kind of play that go between role and present ourselves as almost like a quasi kind of buyer's broker. So, and sometimes we sign confidentiality, confidentiality agreements with brokers and park owners in order to get financial information that we're not allowed to disclose to the residents until we're able to put together an agreement. And then, and then obviously the residents get to know everything. Once, once the agreement has been signed and, and the agreement has lots of contingencies for them to get out if it proves to not be the deal they want. But, um, but that's when we kind of are able to share information. Great, that's really insightful, John, and speaks to Lisa's earlier Point, how it's all about relationships. Um, Lisa, we got a couple questions in the chat about your lending program. Um, 
could you talk maybe a little bit about the pool of funds, how you maybe started that lending program? And then someone asked about defaults and um, if you experienced that and maybe how you deal with them. You're muted. Yep, we've had no defaults. Um, we created the program uh, really because I was hearing from the community that the loss of this narrative of the quirky, you know, quirky folks who were able to put it together and kind of in scrappy ways. Um, and so we did about two years of research into learning about securities laws and consumer financial protection laws, because we have to operate within both of those areas and uh, formed a study group, set up a bunch of policies and then rolled it out. And, and we had some focus groups with potential investors who are all individuals in our community. This is, this is back to like the early, this is what CDFIs used to be <laughs> before they became big and have, have uh, most CDFIs now don't even know what it means to create a pathway for an individual to invest in them. Um, so we're back to the old community loan fund roots of CDFIs. Uh, with no aspirations of becoming a CDFI. Um, so it's individuals. Uh, as I said, we had focus groups with both prospective borrowers and prospective investors, got enough energy and, and enthusiasm. And so we have about uh, $1.8 million that's pooled. Uh, right now we have seven active loans. I think my slide was a little out of date. Um, and generally, each of the loans to a borrower, we project to be anywhere from four to seven years. And so then one of the other challenges, of course, we have is like any lending institution having to align the cash flow of when we pay back the investors and when we get money back from the borrowers. So um, luckily, all of our investors, it's mission for them that they're, it's part of, they see it as part of their, instead of making a contribution, they're making a low interest rate loan to us. Thank you. So, um... John, could you also um, speak to funding sources for that 10 years of TA that seems really vital and also maybe something that's a challenge to find funding for? Yeah, great question. So um, most of the funding for our program comes from closing fees on, on transactions. So you know we, we do charge a fee to the project, which is included in the financing. So it's not like we're going to the residents to ask them to pay anything. Um, depending on which lenders we get financing from, some of them may actually pay us a servicing fee, a little, a little piece of the interest rate on the loan. And that's the most sustainable model. But in some cases, we do you know, require the co-op to also include some of our TA fees in their annual operating budget. But it's, it's usually some combination of you know, a small amount in the operating budget and you know, some compensation from the lenders. Because we're really, you know, we're providing a credit enhancement for them and, you know, helping to service their loan. And we do provide loan servicing documentation. We're sending the lenders, you know, all kinds of monthly and quarterly financial information and, um, and helping them to keep those loans good. And I did post the links in the chat, Gwen. Um, I, can, I can put them in once again, just so they pop up at the bottom. There's a few questions. I think this will be our last question that maybe you all can chime in on related to geography, um, where these models might work best, uh, local zoning codes. Um, maybe if you could just speak to this question about your service area, but also for others in different parts of the country, um, maybe how they can think about their own communities and which model might be best for them to approach. I will, community land trusts can work anywhere, um, urban, rural, suburban. And I would say uh, part of what I love about the community land trust model is it almost always reflects the community where it is, that there are some core elements that are, you know, there's best practices, there's now grounded solutions network um, that is the carries on the model lease and a technical manual and you know work that we've done as a collective of folks uh, nationwide over the last 30 or 40 years um, but it's a very adaptable to the nuances of a local community and so just in san juan county uh, we are a county of islands and so there are three community land trusts in this small county and each of them has to has rolled out their model slightly differently and it just reflects the people who show up and um, obviously, you know, manufactured home communities 
exist in greater numbers in some parts of the country than others. There's sort of, sort of areas that are much more heavily populated with MHCs. So that that's worth looking at. And I would also say, you know, that that size matters in these in these communities because if you have a community of you know 10 or 12 homes, you know, you might be able to get an interim board started, but when it comes to leadership succession and you know, kind of it takes a lot of people power, you know, volunteer effort to run a cooperative and people can get burned out, you know. And so so we all we kind of think about like. 40 or more owner occupied homes as being kind of the minimum, you know, that it takes to have a really healthy cooperative corporation. So that, that's a consideration. And also financing wise, you know, generally it, it's difficult to do our work, you know, on very small communities because it's the same amount of staff time to work with a 10 unit park as with a 160 unit community. So it's, and, and you know, the, the fee structure is, makes it much more doable to, to maintain communities at larger sizes. I just, I, I dropped a link of where you can find a NeighborWorks Network organization earlier. Um, and then I just dropped in another link that's a, a document that was created by some network organizations considering different shared equity models. And I would agree that there is not like one place where one of these works versus others. There, there are many layers of things that are going to impact your success. Um, and it does really start with the community and the residents you're working with and what are their desires and what do those resident leaders think. So dropping it there. And John, I think that your links are just going to host in panelists. I think that's why folks can't see them. Sorry. Whoops. Thank you. Well, um, we can make sure that all the links are shared afterwards, as well as a recording and the slides, contact information, all that good stuff. Um, we are going to conclude here. So Jenny, Lisa, John, thank you all so much for sharing your time, expertise, insights on this really important topic. I um, also want to say thank you to all of our partners and attendees for joining this latest installment of our Raising the Roof webinar series. If you have any ideas or suggestions for future topics, please do email me and we'll try to bring together some more experts to have a future conversation. And with that, uh, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks all.